Okay, so uh, when you're reading your book, uh, you can also look for evidence of military masculinity. Uh, so we've talked about that already in the previous uh, lectures, but uh, look for evidence of a kind of uh, tough guys, so the facade that the men have to carry themselves um, under uh, as soldiers, and look for evidence of conflict with that uh, part of their identity. Um, you can also look for the sort of divide between men and women, uh, which some critics have sort of criticized uh, Tim O'Brien for uh, as reinforcing uh, gender ideas or conventional uh, depictions or stereotypes about gender. Um, and we also have a sense, you know, the weight, uh, the burden uh, that these men are under um, and how that relates to their masculine ident identities. Uh, over the course of the book, some of the earlier uh, stories will will talk about the men as, uh, you know, under a burden of their masculinity and uh, having to uh, do their duty as soldiers. And then by the end of the book, uh, we get sort of the transformation that these uh, characters have gone under how they are no longer the same uh, men uh, that they were when they entered the war. Um, so it is uh, an element of, you know, disillusionment and uh, change, transformation that occurs um, over the course of the book. Um, some, some short stories that, you know, I think obviously are pertinent to the theme of military masculinity. Uh, the title story, the things they carried, uh, is an important one. Um, on the Rainy River, uh, this is page 43 in my book, uh, that's the one dealing with Tim O'Brien's uh, character, how he has conflict uh, in related to being drafted into the military, um, and it deals with issues of, you know, being considered a coward if he uh, does not uh, follow the draft. Um, how to tell a true war story. That's another one uh, that deals with masculinity in kind of a direct way. Uh, there's also the divide between men and women in that one uh, that is pretty important. Um, Sweetheart of the Song Trabong. Uh, that one is kind of interesting in that it's sort of defies some of uh, the gender conventions in how uh, women were viewed. Uh, but I would, again, look through them all if you have time, uh, go through and read each of the stories. Uh, the gender context is uh, important to each of the uh, stories in the collection. And then the last theme that I wanted to talk about is war as meaningless destruction. Uh, so there is no, you know, single moral or uh, lesson to be learned from uh, Tim O'Brien's work and uh, one's left with a sort of sense of uh, meaninglessness of the war effort. Uh, so there is a sense of um, moral or ethical uh, disillusionment uh, that Tim O'Brien, our narrator, uh, conveys and a lot of, you know, lives, innocent lives were lost and uh, changed over the course of the war. Uh, so you do get a sense that uh, all of this death and destruction uh, is, in a sense, meaningless. So it becomes almost like an anti-war narrative as well. So uh, even though Tim O'Brien is a soldier, a veteran of the Vietnam War, it does convey a sense of, uh, you know, the harsh realities uh, that are part of the war experience. So definitely uh, take a look while you're reading, uh, consider some of these uh, themes and uh, make note of uh, important passages in your reading. Okay, so uh, before we get into the specific short stories, uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, the genre. Um, so this uh, collection of stories can be viewed as uh, historiographic metafiction. 
And we've already come across this term uh, in Timothy Finley's The Wars, uh, but these are uh, novels, uh, works of fiction that blend together um, real historical uh, events and real people uh, with uh, fictional elements. So it's kind of any text that blurs the lines between history and fiction. Um, and this term is, uh, was coined by uh, Linda Hutchian, uh, who describes narratives, historiographic metafiction as intensely self-reflexive and also lay claim to historical events and personages. So any fiction that does that. Uh, so Tim O'Brien is doing this in interesting ways. So he has himself written into the stories. Uh, so we, even though he insists that uh, the story is a work of fiction, so that's the sort of subtitle, uh, the things they carry to work of fiction, uh, he also uh, kind of blurs this line. And in his dedication, he says, this book is lovingly dedicated to the men of Alpha Company, and in particular to Jimmy Cross, Norman Boker, Rat Kiley, Mitchell Sanders, Henry Dobbins, and Kiowa. So all characters who feature in his stories. Um, so in that sense, he's sort of blurring the lines. We don't know what's truth and what is fiction. Uh, we don't know if these things actually happen to him. Uh, but they read like memoirs. And uh, we have a sense that, you know, even if he is, you know, stretching uh, truth in some regards or adding elements that are fictionalized, that the core of these stories are truth, right? So they read as uh, memories, his memories of uh, the war. So in that sense, it is a very sort of powerful uh, narrative. And I don't know about you, but one of the reasons why I like uh, fiction is because it imagines history in a sort of intimate and real way. Like you're, as a reader, transcend uh, and get a sense of what it would really be like to be in that situation because we are so uh, closely uh, aligned with a character in the book. Um, so you sort of see through their eyes uh, what they're experiencing. And it's just different than if you just read the facts in a history textbook. Uh, fiction, in a way, brings more truth, uh, brings the truth to, uh, to light and uh, makes it more real. Uh, so that's one of the interesting things about historical metafiction is the fact that even though we uh, sort of place it in the genre of fiction, in some ways it is truer than a history book, which has a bunch of facts in it, right? So uh, it's one of these sort of paradoxical things that uh, we enjoy about reading fiction. So let's start our discussion of the title story, uh, The Things They Carried. So in this first uh, story of your book, uh, we are focused on the character of First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross, and he is a 24-year-old uh, man, and he is the First Lieutenant, so he is responsible for uh, the rest of his uh, infantry troop, um, and they are... Uh, this, the title comes uh, to reflect all of the heavy burden that they carry, both physical and uh, ab abstract, non-tangible non elements that they carry with them. Uh, so the emotional and psychological burdens of being a soldier, in addition to uh, the physical weight of their backpacks. And uh, I've had, you know, I've asked students to sort of make note of uh, the physical and the uh, immaterial objects in uh, that are listed that each men carry. And one student actually added up all of the uh, sort of weight measurements. So you'll notice in, if you're reading, it lists, you know, how much each item or article weighs. Uh, and I think at the most, uh, a soldier could carry, you know, 220 pounds of, uh, you know, artillery or the, the everything that's attached to them, uh, their weapons, their... Uh, jackets, their, uh, the radio. So at its most, I think it was like 220 pounds uh, that you would carry on your back. 
uh, if you were uh, a soldier on the infantry, foot soldier. Um, and then the men's age is kind of interesting. So these are all very young men. Um, Jimmy Cross, who's leading, who's responsible for the other men's lives, is only 24. Um, but the average age of a soldier was 19. So you have to sort of put into context the fact that uh, these are very young uh, men who are uh, have sort of uh, they're in a position of great uh, responsibility and are facing life and death uh, scenarios. Um, and I'm sure you all can sort of relate to being uh, that age as well. Uh, so uh, that's something to keep in mind when we learn more about uh, these characters and. Uh, how they deal with the conflicts that they're faced with on the uh, battlefield. Uh, so Jimmy Cross is our uh, protagonist for this story. Uh, he's the one we sort of uh, focus most on. And we get to know that he is in love with a girl named Martha. Uh, so Martha, he is in love with her, but it is an unrequited love. She doesn't feel the same way about him that he feels about her. Um, so Jimmy Cross is uh, somewhat lovesick, right? He is uh, distracted and uh, he is sort of fixated on Martha because of uh, what she represents to him. So she's not only uh, this unrequited love, but I think she's also a kind of reminder of his previous life, um, his childhood, uh, boyhood, uh, being a young man, his hometown. So everything that is being left behind uh, while he is, uh, uh, you know, becoming this lieutenant. So Martha is sort of a, uh, a distraction for him and the story sort of chronicles how he attempts to sort of separate uh, his childhood innocence, uh, who he was before, with the man that he uh, is forced to become um, as being as the lieutenant and in charge of the lives of his men. Uh, so the changing point, the conflict, the main uh, sort of inciting incident in uh, this story is the death of Ted Lavender. Uh, so one of Jimmy Cross's men, Ted Lavender, uh, dies and uh, Jimmy Cross bears a lot of the guilt or burden of guilt uh, on his shoulders because he is uh, the lieutenant. Um, and, you know, Ted Lavender's death marks a, a moment, uh, an event that changes Jimmy Cross. So uh, he's never the same man that he was uh, following this incident. So Ted Lavender's death really uh, takes its toll on uh, Jimmy Cross. And uh, it's interesting if you take note of uh, how certain objects that the men carry have a kind of uh, symbolic value as well. Uh, so if you look at uh, certain characters, there's a lot of description, so a lot of, uh, it's easy to sort of confuse uh, the character. So if I were you, I would sort of jot down uh, the characters' names and uh, make note of some specific articles that they each carry. And because uh, these characters will repeatedly uh, be present in the rest of the stories, it's a good way to just sort of keep them separate in your mind because I know, uh, you know, it, it's easy to confuse uh, one character with the next one. Uh, but Ted Lavender. Uh, is shot and the things that he carries are quite interesting so on page four uh, they said Ted Lavender who was scared carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside the village of Tan K in mid-April so uh, he carried further down page four he carried six or seven ounces of premium dope which for him was a necessity so that's one of the things we can think about is you know why uh, are certain articles that are carried important to that uh, character. So for Ted Lavender, dope is a necessity. Uh, it's something that tranquilizes him. 
uh, that calms him down. 